Gran Turismo, one of the most revolutionary and outright innovative franchises in the interactive entertainment industry. With global sales climbing north of 80 million units, this single series is by far the highest selling video game exclusive to PlayStation. Its true to life game mechanics and razor sharp detail has elevated the industry standard to new heights like never before. And with 13 installments over a 20 year lifespan, many auto enthusiasts, including myself, can attribute much of the passion for motorsport to this single game. And with the launch of the seventh main title, GT7 promises to continue to raise the bar, fight the competition from Xbox's Forza series, and continue to host a globally recognized racing series to turn gamers into real racers. This is Gran Turismo Beyond Simulation. I know you're gonna dig this. This is a story that begins like many in the past. It's a story of driving for perfection, where one man's lifelong ambition is to share a growing yet far-fetched community of auto enthusiasts out with the world. It's about a man who spearheaded a revolutionary game design company and is now forever immortalized as a modern architectural great, Kazanuri Yamuchi. A name that echoes words such as perfection or resilient with every call of the name. Kazanuri, or as the industry would refer to him as, Kaz, is the CEO of Polyphony Digital and is revered in Japan and Sony Entertainment as one of the most influential game designers of all time. Now, it would be reasonable for the average viewer to have never come across the name or Polyphony Digital before. It certainly doesn't carry the same kind of precedent as other industry giants including Activision, EA or Ubisoft does. In fact, this company was created for one launch title and one launch title only. A racing game that was for the real racers. Gran Turismo, the real driving simulator. This was envisioned to be the ultimate video game for both casual and more dedicated racing enthusiasts. It was designed to bring the harshness of motorsport to the palms of the player, and to achieve this, Kazanuri needed to make the player feel at one with the car. You see, up until the release of the very first installment of Gran Turismo in December of 97, gamers could only experience wildly fast sports cars or wacky races in the form of Mario Karts and next to nothing in between. There was no true dedicated racing game for circuit racing. Kazunuri wanted gamers to pick up a copy of the video game and feel comfortable with the extensive game mechanics. So right from the very beginning, the Japanese based developers set out a goal to bring the everyday cars into the game itself. Kazunuri believed that everyone had the driving spirit and this was the best way to extract it. The series would very quickly go on to making games that exceeded 1000 in-game drivable cars and also feature circuits from all over the world, and this was all packaged in a way that rivals weren't able to do. You see, very often in business, there is a trade-off between volume and quality, not about how many people's lives you change, but how well you change them. Well, at Polyphony Digital, the same principles applied. At first, the series focused on bringing a new dynamic lighting design which would send shockwaves throughout the industry, and this would quickly help establish the rhythm that the Japanese company would look to go about their business, and to do it with passion. But it wasn't until two years later that the game quickly expanded to showcasing over 600 drivable cars, and come the next generation launches with the PlayStation 2, or well, Sony Entertainment were ready to show off the capability of their brand new console, and to help them achieve this, at E3 2000, the world was blown away by the third installment of Gran Turismo. Now, in later years, Kaz admitted that his team's efforts on the third game were rushed and in many ways cut short, down to impending deadlines that Sony had held them to. A playable racing game had to be available at the time of launch for the next gen console, but the men and women at Polyphony Digital were only midway through their build. Kazanuri had no choice but to pull the plug early and make the game as polished as physically possible come release date. The release did what it was intended to do. It was the poster boy and with it the name of the final release was altered to Gran Turismo 3, A-Spec. 
This was intended to demonstrate that Sony is number one in every genre, but Kazunori wasn't convinced until his team had produced a fully loaded title. And mere weeks after the launch of GT3, work commenced in the next installment. And this time with all the added time and power. This time, the player would get to experience everything. Gran Turismo 4 would release in Japan in late of 2004 and March the following year in the rest of the world. It was received with monumental grandeur and critically acclaimed reviews from global publications. The gap between reality and the virtual space had considerably shrunk, all in favour of the new release. But for hardcore simulator enthusiasts, there was more than just pretty lighting and more realistic weather systems to win them over. Gamers and even test drivers pegged themselves at the game just to test out how realistic the game physics were and how true to life handling was to real life cars. Perhaps none more notorious was the head to head review conducted by Top Gear's Jeremy Clarkson who at the time drove the Honda NSX at the real life Laguna Seca racetrack and then again on the GT4 simulator. I am going to pick a track, uh, I'm going to go for a real one, one that exists in real life, Laguna Seca. Here we go. Fine start, I want to cross that line at 100 miles an hour. He pointed out that adjusting one's braking mid-turn in a real car could cause loss of control, and also mentioned that the same was true for the game. He was compelled to take bigger risks than he would in real life, and that in-game the car did not suffer from brake fade. Beyond the realism of the game, the ethos of GT was to ensure that the game had featured as many cars as possible, and the Tokyo based team didn't hold back by pushing the official car list to over 70 vehicles from 80 manufacturers. To put it simply, this was a huge step for the franchise, but more importantly, the entire racing segment. There's a fantastic video which covers this title in much more detail by the Purple Guy123. I'll leave a link in the description to his channel and I'm sure for much of you watching this will bring back a lot of fond memories of the game. By this point, I feel that the rhythm has been set out by the Japanese firm's productions. Big numbers, unbeatable graphical fidelity and simulator-esque physics systems. It'd be enough for the company to continue this formula of game design for the many years and consoles to come, and that would be more than enough for fans to indulge over. After all, what can really be done with the limitations of a couple of hundred dollar gaming consoles? How much more creative could a racing game become? But what is a magician without one more trick? One more titanic goal for a game that is yet to be replicated in the entire racing segment. For years, Kaz had wanted to share his love for motorsport with others. He knew that this was a money talk sport and now that he had grown a global audience, well, the time was right to reveal his top trumping card. On the eve of a cold winter night in 2007, Polyphony Digital and Nissan's Darren Cox had designed a whole new way to game. They had created one of the most industry disruptive concepts around and something that probably won't be replicated to the fullest for a very long time. Enter GT Academy. GT Academy was to be the ultimate opportunity to graduate players of Gran Turismo into the real world of racing. Yes, racing. It was a competition which was open to anyone, meaning that no matter what part of the world you were from or what kind of social or economic demographic you were a part of, you could peg yourself against the game and qualify towards a military style training camp with Nissan. Here the drivers would battle it out adopting a fast track approach to motorsport and then a panel style judging system would go on to select one driver and give them a fully funded season with Nissan's driver development program as well as an entry into an international racing series against seasoned professionals. Yes, you heard that correctly. A complete novice of motorsport would in the space of 9 months go from a gaming chair to starting a professional race. Nothing like this had ever been tried before in any sport. It was such an intriguing competition that the whole event became a reality TV show with millions of global viewers over all seasons and at the heart of it all was a video game simulator. Pure marketing genius. Winners of the academy went on to represent Nissan's racing division Nismo as well as transition over to single seater racing. I personally remember watching the success of the very first GT Academy winner and watch his pursuit to motorsport glory. Lucas Ordonis was the average gamer and embodied all of the qualities that can 
has envisioned in a racing driver. But more importantly, he was testament that Gran Turismo truly worked. It really was the platform for passionate gamers to live out the simulation. For as long as I can remember, car culture was always about appreciating the craft and the creativity of one another's build. Car culture was and still is about telling a story and creating a narrative behind each and every single vehicle. It's to see the machines not just as a utility, but also to see them as conduits of ingenuity, showing off personality and characteristics that go beyond the faces of engineering. Now this idea of car culture was a core pillar of the Gran Turismo franchise, with the developers nod towards the art of car photography, both in the amateur and professional spheres. Now modern games take this photo mode for granted and often pass this off as a gimmick of the game, but for more veterans of the genre, well, they can really look back and appreciate that GT pioneered a photorealistic capturing system that was several paces ahead of anything else on the market. The depth of realism of such a mode gave everyday people a way to learn about different mechanics of optics, range, ISOs, as well as focal length and apertures. Now I can liken this as an entry level course into car photography, and on a more personal note, it for sure contributed to my own interest into filmmaking. This is actually one of the very first photos I took back in 2010 in the GT5 photo mode on the PlayStation 3. Now I can recall how impressed I was with the bokeh effect around the silhouette of the Maserati and in the incredible depth of detail into the headlights. I can remember instantly downloading it onto the hard drive of the console and then transferring it over to my laptop. This photo, along with many others, was shared with, along with my friends who also shared a passion for motorsport. And, well like many other races of Gran Turismo, it sparked our newfound interest into the car racing scene. The immersiveness of these modes allowed any car to be placed anywhere at any time of the day. It was above anything, just amazing. In the many years since I took that very first photo of the red Maserati, I've come across tons of Facebook groups that focus just on showing off the craziest car collections in some of the most peculiar locations, and they were all captured on this one series. ま、自動車文化とは何かというのは、あの、ま、すごく幅広いですよね。自動車文化の幅というのは。あの、車というのは、ま、工業製品の中では、ま、最も美しい工業製品の一つだと思いますけれども、あの、その車の形の美しさ